uranium. When you woke up this morning, did you purposely say, I'm going to confine myself to a box? Or do you just avoid putting any conscious thought into today? When you're busy going at it, literally or figuratively, do you ever find yourself pausing for a moment to realize what's going on? Or are you just reacting? When you hear the saying, may I have your attention, please, do you continue as you were, or do you consider the information you're about to receive might actually be valuable? When I was growing up, my mother used to ask me to do things, and sometimes her reasoning was, because I said so. Looking back, I wish perhaps I took the time to pause, think, and consider the ramifications of my choices. Good Monday to you. Today is Monday, November 28th, 2016, and this is episode number 56 of Pause, Think, Consider. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. Today we have a very special guest, none other than my good friend, Jeff Flowers. And Jeff is here today to talk with us about the topic of becoming and getting cultured. Jeff has a very unique situation having lived abroad for many years and also growing up within a military family moving around and yet where Jeff and I being essentially the odd couple as our circle calls us Jeff being six foot eight me being five foot eight also separated by 10 years in age And yet our collective age, as some people would question, is probably about three years old. However, we get along so well, and we often have talks about my generation and other generations and people's inabilities to adapt to their surroundings. And one of the things that Jeff and I have been able to do through a lot of travel together and also individually, as we've been able to make ourselves adaptable, adapt to whatever situation, any environment, regardless of the type of people that are involved. And our perception is that other people, as a result of not necessarily being cultured, not necessarily having the same experiences that we've had, at times can struggle with it. And so we have these back and forth conversations all the time. But I want to hear from Jeff, first and foremost, lay the groundworks for his experience and his experiences that he have had and why the experience he's had has laid the groundwork for this cultural understanding which then enables him to be adaptable in many different situations. Thank you, Jesse. My background, born California, but as a military kid, you grow up all over the place. And by the time I was 18 years old, I had lived in 10 different places before I moved to Portland to go to college. I was in Portland for all four years of college. And for one more year after that, before I got a phone call to be able to go, go work overseas and then spend six years in the Philippines. And the biggest thing that makes adapting critical is when you're moving around basically every 18 months, you have to pick up on the new culture that you're in. And when I say that, the East Coast is different than the West Coast. California is different than Oregon, and et cetera, et cetera. So you have to understand what's going on. You got to understand how to talk to people and get to know people and adjust very quickly so that you can create friendships and be able to survive in an area by having people to connect with. Yeah, I would agree, Jeff. In our vocation that we share together, through it, it requires us to learn and interact with a very diverse group of people. Many different backgrounds, many different ethnicities, many different experiences, age ranges, the whole gamut of things. And 
I would be curious to hear from your perspective why it is that you believe that not only for yourself, but then myself as well, because we are very much alike in this manner. What is it that draws people and enables us to get along with nearly any different type of individual? My opinion is I think it's it's a situation where you and I both are very good at asking questions and creating some sort of a connection with folks. We're approachable. We talk about anything and everything. As Jesse said, our collective age when we're together is usually about three. On a good day, it might get up to five. And just us being able to, to be laid back because we're used to this, it is what we do, it draws people in because, one, I think we're a lot of fun. Two, we don't get wrapped around the axle and stuff because we're adjusting and understanding what other people want. And we generally are interested to hear what other people have to say to create different connections. And we talk about that all the time as far as who we get along with and everything else. And there's a connection that we have with every single person some way, somehow, that we uh, we talk about. It could be the vocation itself. But there's a lot of the guys we talk just about life in general with, and we found things to connect on that. And so when we get together, it's, hey, you know, how's the family? How's work? Did you travel anywhere? You know, Facebook's a great great avenue for us to have some information when we don't talk to guys uh, as frequently as we do would like to sometimes but you know you see what they're the, what they've been up to you see what they're doing and you ask about it and that creates the conversation you get into a lot of different discussions that aren't always focused on one thing and one thing only yeah you bring up a really great topic that scales really across generations and I know with you raising your kids, this has at times been a sore spot. And I bring up Facebook. Because, again, generationally, culturally, it is, of my opinion, that we have lost the ability to communicate with each other. We're so tech-centric, Facebook-centric, that we've lost the ability to communicate together and through that where where is that line jeff that not only you draw for yourself but then also for your kids and your daughters to ensure that they're as well-rounded as possible they have as many experiences as you had growing up the big thing i tell you tell them is, is have a conversation you see something on facebook ask about it and i'm not saying send a message on facebook i'm saying talk to your friends tell them about it you see something and you're interested in it, or do you have questions? Nothing wrong with saying, hey, how was your trip to Disneyland? What did you like about it? And, and you, you know, Facebook, using that as the example, is, is a great way to have get information because you see what people are doing. But everybody wants to keep to the instant message or the text and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, you know, which is fine. It, it serves its purpose in the right ways, but when you're with people... You can get that information to help start a conversation. And I don't post a lot to Facebook. I uh, put pictures up every once in a while on different things. And that has triggered you know, a lot of my conversations with folks, folks asking me or me asking them if they posted something. And I think that's the biggest thing is to be able to use that information because you're, you're giving a little bit more information than just walking up to somebody and going, Hi, I'm Jeff. What's your name? And being able to start that you have something available to you right then and there that actually can kickstart that because I know a lot of people have no idea what to say to somebody when they first meet them. Well, if you're already friends on Facebook or you know somebody that is and you can have that and go, oh, I saw you were in Disneyland or I saw you took a trip to the Philippines or I saw that you were you know, in New York or wherever that is, you, see, you can ask that question and, and be able to use that as your catalyst to actually use words when you pick up a phone or you see somebody in person for the next the next time you see them. Yeah, so you bring up a very interesting skill set that I personally, and I will tell the story after hearing your opinion, but to give a preview, the story of he's in sales. But so with that, and being able to have those conversations, let's throw Facebook out the door, right? 
and just being able to have those conversations with people. Because I feel myself, and this story will exemplify my reasoning for this, but I'm somebody that if I have information, if I'm part of a group, I can connect and I can talk with anyone. The starting the conversation, which is where I think you're really good at, and I've seen it because, again, he's in sales, you're a part of the story, but how is it, and your advice, maybe you're giving advice to me, but how is it that through your experiences you're able to make those connections, and I view it as cold calling. I would never do cold calling in my entire life to just walk up to some random ass person, male, female, whatever, and be able to have and initiate a conversation. I can do the conversation. I can keep the conversation going and move forward. It's that icebreaker point. So what in your life has allowed you to develop that skill? Biggest thing for me is I you know, being ten years older, and not to say that you're super young comparison because you're on the older side of the Facebook generation, so to speak. And I didn't have that information. I didn't have that availability to me to be able to have that information. So I had to walk up to somebody and just say, hi, how you doing? Um, if they had a baseball in their hand, hey, you like baseball? I like playing baseball. I did as a kid at least. Uh, you got a basketball in your hand. Uh, and I want to try to play sometime, you know, you're at the gym, whatever that is. And so you find and you pay attention to what's around you and you kind of see what they've got. Are they carrying a book? Are they listening to some type of music? Are they able to do something like that? You know, I'm six foot eight. And when I walk in a room, people usually notice that I've walked in the room. I use that as a big aspect to it. I get all asked all the time, how tall are you? And I tell them five foot three. Just for the reaction purposes, break the ice a little bit, get people kind of laughing. And then from there, you're able to kind of have a conversation with them. You know, somebody comes up, you're tall, and I tell them they're short. Or, you know, you're bigger than everybody. No, everybody else is just shorter. You know, just a little stuff to try to break that ice usually helps to create a little bit of a laugh, and then we're able to have a conversation and just BS about whatever after the fact. So, as I mentioned, I promised I would tell this story. So... This was long enough ago that I was actually still drinking. We were in the metropolis that is Chico, California. Buddy's Weekend. And we went to this place, I'll never forget it. It's called the Dancing Bear in Chico, California. A buddy of ours said, you have to go there. He went to school there for, I don't know, eight, nine years. And that was the place that he lived at. So we went to the Dancing Bear. We swear that we actually saw a photo of him up in the dancing bear. So we're downing $2 Sierra Nevadas like it's the prohibition and having a great night. And I go to relieve myself and come back thinking, hey, we're going to take off. And Jeff essentially says, we're getting one more and we're going to watch Liebman go to work. There's two gals that have been across the way for the entire time. And they're sitting there at the table just talking and nobody else is talking to them. And Jeff goes, Jesse, and I was not with anybody at the time. We're going to watch you perform. I essentially said, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know how I get the start. Jeff goes, no problem. I'll take care of this. So he walks up to him. Or no, our other buddy, our other buddy, Darren. Darren says, no problem, I got this, Jesse. I'll chit-chat him, warm him all up, you come right in, and then it'll be like the rodeo. We'll see how long he can stay on. And I waited, and I waited, and Jeff finally said, dude, what the hell are you doing? you going to get over there? To which I replied, Jeff, he's in sales. He's in sales. He, he knows what he's doing. I'm not in sales. I don't know how to talk to people. And that's essentially how the story ended from my perspective. Jeff, you have anything to add on the he's in sales story? The only thing I would say is that you were a little more emphatic that you were not in sales. And Darren was to the point where you're almost screaming at me about it. And then you finally kind of, I wouldn't, you didn't even walk over. You kind of 
sheepishly crawled over to finally have the conversation. And then once you were there, you know, I, I was not privy to the conversation, but you were there for a few minutes having the conversation with the gals and it seemed to go okay. And it was just funny to watch <laughs> Jesse have to <laughs> try to figure out what am I going to say? What am I going to do? How am I going to act? He's so worried about it all instead of just going over there and having a conversation with somebody. That's about <laughs> I just laughed thinking about it because you know, I was watching like a <laughs> a little kid that had no idea what was going on around him try to figure this thing out. <laughs> it was priceless. Yeah, it's definitely a memory that we bring up all the time. All the time. And whenever we're with Darren... We always bring up he's in sales, and we know instantly what situation that we're talking about. But, and that was, gosh, five, six years ago now at this point. I'd like to think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, I'd like to think I've developed a little bit since then, and I even point fun like, hey, maybe I'm in sales now. So, from... Your outside perspective, what is the maturation process that you've had to witness from he's in sales to today? I would say it's just a matter of just getting comfortable, being uncomfortable with it, because anytime you meet somebody new, no matter what you're doing, you've got to be able to just have a conversation. People are people. You know, you, as soon as you say hi to somebody, you're going to figure out whether or not you want to spend any more time talking to them pretty quick. And just having that understanding just to say, be polite. You know, just go by and say, hi, how are you? And if you, get a, if you get a positive response, you have an in. If someone just says, hey, and what kind of turns to mind their own business, just move on. Nothing wrong with that. We're not going to get along with everybody. You're not going to. But you've got to be able to at least have that conversation. And, again, the bigger part of where I'm going with this is that you've got to pick up on the clues that somebody has opened up and is engaged in the fact that you have acknowledged them and said hello to them. And if they do that, there's your opening. Take advantage of it. Have the conversation. Start asking, what do they do? What do they do for their hobbies? You know, family, la da 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 It doesn't matter what it is. And, and you'll find out whether or not you've got something in common or not. Yeah, I think also it's a part of not necessarily the egotistical macho male thing, but it is funny, and we've both had these experiences over the years where we've tried to do the conversation, and the epic shutdowns and fails that occurred are just, its it makes the evening almost to a certain degree. So I want to pivot very quickly to because you have international experience. You lived overseas. It's where you met your wife had your first kid, etc., and it's a very unique experience. I had the opportunity to spend a little bit of time in college, two weeks overseas, London, Paris, and Germany, and just that experience of being over there, I think, helped me understand what was beyond just our borders, because I traveled a lot vacation-wise with my family. We went, I've been to almost every state that there is in the United States. And yet, when I finally went to Europe, I got a better understanding for not only how the world views America, but how to adapt and how to fit in, even if you don't know the actual language. And I think that's part of the whole experience and being able to communicate with other people, being able to adapt. So can you talk a little bit about Jeff your experience overseas, and really the learning experiences you took away from that. Back in 2000, I got a phone call to be able to go work overseas. And at the time, I was 23 years old. And I jumped at it. You know, basically packed up my stuff and hopped on an airplane. No idea who's picking me up at the airport. No, had no clue. Showed up. Luckily, somebody was there to grab me. Had a nice little sign up. Said, hey, great. Okay, now I'm with you. And then uh, 
at that point, I'm just kind of just sitting back and watching and seeing what, what's going on around me. And when you go overseas, you've got to pick up on things quickly enough so that you can understand what culture you're in, what's the do's, what's the don'ts, and, and have that awareness to be able to try to fit in a little bit and see what you can do with that. And that's where I think a lot of people fail is they don't pay attention to what's around them. And so we always hear about the ugly American. You're in another culture. Understand you're in another country. Understand what they're about. Understand what what it is that makes them tick and what, what you do and what you don't. And so, you know, spent a lot of time just observing and watching, being very quiet, just to understand my surroundings. And I asked a lot of questions. What do you do when this happens? What do you do when that happens? How do you handle this? How do you handle that? And it, it's, it enlightens you a lot to understand a lot more about what's going on in the world and realize that there's a, a lot around you and a lot of life and a lot of experience and a ton of things I took away from that. You know, my, my six years over there because I don't get wrapped around the axle anymore. You know, and there's a story for you on, when I was over there. So I was out of town for a weekend and come back to find out that my house and my my uh, friend's house who lived right next door, we'd been broken into. And basically everything stolen. And it was just a unique situation where you're, you're angry. What are you, you doing, right? And so we go to practice the next day. I was over there playing basketball. And the local guys on our basketball team basically were just, they took the situation, and Filipino culture is really good with this. Is They started making jokes about it. Not to be mean. It was their way of trying to bring the tension down. And it was their way to try to make things okay and better. That, hey, we're here. We're, you know, shit happens. Sucks, yes. And it sucks because, you know, it took us a little while to get our things back in order and everything else. But it, it took care of itself. But it was more about just the... The way that the folks interacted with us to take care of us in a different way than things here. You know, here it's like I feel like something bad happens. People don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. It gets really awkward. You know, there it was like all of a sudden the guys showed up and they had food for us for dinner and everything else. And cause we didn't have anything. We sat outside, barbecued the food, and had a grand time drinking and eating after practice one night because it was their way of being there for us, but also just laughing and joking about it. And it was a joke that we had going on for the rest of the season. I mean, this happened early in the year, and it, it stayed with the team as a whole rest of the way. And it was just great to have that experience to be able to see people not get wrapped around the axle and just kind of go with the flow. Yeah, I think that learning to be comfortable while you're uncomfortable and being able to roll with the punches, or as you've coined it, Jeff, not getting wrapped around the axle, is a skill that can't really be taught. It has to come through actual experiences. And so maybe this is a shout out to the younger generation. Maybe it's just to people who haven't had the experiences that you or I have had, Jeff, in order to go international, in order to travel as much as we have. But what kind of advice would you give? What type of experiences do other people need to seek out? I mean, physically seek out in order to be adaptable, in order to ensure that they don't sweat the small stuff and that you're able to adapt and move on no matter high or how low you wind up getting in life. My advice would be get out of the country. And if you have an opportunity, I mean, when you're young, if you're getting out of school and you have the opportunity to go teach English in another country, take it. Take it. It'd be my, my advice to anybody. And if you're just traveling, which is fine too, get out and see things. You know, when we traveled to the other American on my team, whenever we traveled 
to another country outside the Philippines to play, first thing we always asked the hotel lobby was, all right, where's that to go hang out? And first response is always going to be, they're going to send you the tourist areas, et cetera. And we said, no, we don't want that. We want to go experience and see where do the locals go? Where do the, where do they go? What do they do? And so, you know, we went to Taiwan three different times and, and got the chance to go to three different cities while I was there. And each time we went, we went to different cities. So we asked and we went to night markets, to the local night markets, not to where all the Americans were, not to where all the other foreigners were. Just That's not what we wanted. We wanted to go out and see what everything else had to do and just walk around and see it and kind of dive into the culture a little bit as best that we could to be able to experience it. And that's what I would tell people is get out. You know, don't go, you know, there's always tourist spots. Everyone's going to always go hit. I get that. I have no problems with that because you got the sightseeing stuff. Cool. Past that, go walk around downtown in the city. Go find the local little bar area and hang out. You know, find that stuff so that you can just sit around and just watch people interact and how they are. It's enlightening and it just helps you get to a better perspective on things and you realize that you know, there's a lot of good things in this country, and there's not some, you know, you also see there's not a lot of good things, too. And be able to just look at that and know, okay, I don't like that. I'm okay with that. But, or I like the way they do that. I want to incorporate that into my lifestyle and be able to have that as my mantra, so to speak, of how you want to do things. Yeah, I think I've found, and we have our own little vocational group, and one of the things that I did because we are associated together. We are a posse of some sorts. And one of the things that I tried to do to develop myself individually, because really it's great being paired together because we get along so well. We're two very, very good friends. But we also have to develop our own individuality to be our own person. And part of that was traveling and going for training without anyone else from the group. And I can remember going at the age of 24, because at 25, you can legally rent a car, and going at 24 to Las Vegas, not knowing a single soul, and somehow, over the course of four days, and our meeting spot, was from the hotel I was staying at because I was staying in a dirt bag hotel that cost me like ten dollars a night, which tells you how much of a dirt bag of a hotel it was in Las Vegas. And networking with people in order to just get rides to and from our meetings. And I look back to that experience of not having you, Jeff, not having anyone else from our circle and being able to adapt and figure it out and survive as what's really helped fuel not only my individuality, but helped fuel my ability that whether you're there or not, I can get along with people. And I think that goes a long way into how each of us have been able to move forward and how we've been able to separate ourselves from the rest of the group. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Um you you doing that, and then you yanked me along on one trip. I'm gonna I'll bring up the Chico um, trip one more time too, because you know Darren Darren you and I went down on that trip just for something different. I mean, we hopped in the car and drove eight hours just for the sake of the training and everything else that we do, and completely California based population on the vocation. And we were the only three guys from out of the state. And I specifically remember the last meeting, being in that room, and, and the, the director of the training session asked the three of us to stand up. And the question posed was, why why did you guys come here? And all three of us had the same answer, because we had all talked about it ahead of time, which was, you know, we all spoke up and said the same thing, which was, we did it 
because the three of us like to get out of town a little bit, number one. Two, get out of our comfort zone. We don't know anybody here, but we wanted to do something different and get some different training, check it out, see what it's like. And there's a handful of people that were at that training session that we continually run into as we've moved up the ranks in our vocation and what we do. And we see them more and more. And it all started at that camp that we went to to be able to have the opportunity to meet a few of these guys and have the discussion with them and just talk to them. And we talked to talked to a few of these guys throughout the throughout the, the winter now. And we also see them in the, the summers at, at different camps. And it was really cool because the camp director stood up basically after we were done talking and looked at the rest of the guys in that room and said, not advise them, but basically kind of got on them a little bit and told them, all of you need to do what they just did. Next thing you know is we've got a handful of the guys that are there up in Seattle at a camp that we're all at. Or they were up at Salem and, you know, different places that we go to and up in the Northwest, and all of a sudden they're showing up for the same reasons. Get out, get a little something different, and be able to do that. And that's the biggest thing is being comfortable being uncomfortable. And I think it's helped us along the way because now we have – these other guys that we talk to and have the ability to reach out to on certain things if we need to. I completely agree. So as a last point in this episode, I want to touch on very briefly because I know we both have some pretty strong opinions about the generational gap and the generational gap in regards to ability to adapt. And I know we're going to wind up doing another podcast on sensitivity, our next one, episode number 57, as a little preview. But in regards to ability to adapt, what have you noticed? And it could be through your kids. It could be people in my generation, or it could be just across the board. But what have you noticed generationally the that hinders people from being able to adapt, from being able to move on, not get wrapped around the axle, whatever acronym you want to use. <laughs> I think the biggest piece is going to be that next episode, sensitivities one. Uh, two, people are too, too stuck on the ways of dealing with communication in the way that it's presented itself because communication in today's world is so easy on a lot of fronts that we failed to remember how to do the simple stuff, which is actually have a conversation, pick up the phone, talk to somebody in person. We don't need to do that anymore. I mean, we see it all the time where people are texting each other and they're four seats away from each other. And it's like, well, you can't look down the, the line and say, hey, Jesse, what's up? You know, I mean, we've, we've, failed and fallen apart on being able to do that so the biggest thing for me for anything is just to be able to have a conversation with somebody be able to talk to them and don't be so so stuck on having to use the technology versus having those you know good hard skills soft skills whatever you want to call it of using your voice and being able to have a conversation yeah i think that directly ties into a previous episode that i did jeff in regards to having phone calls, the lost art of having phone calls and that we utilize our technology far too often. The interesting thing that I've found, and there's been so much information and studies around millennials, and it is really the most polarizing generation because they are, they are both extremes. I've seen millennials that are the laziest sacks of shit that I've ever seen in my entire life. And then I've seen millennials that are so ambitious and are entrepreneurs and are donating gobs amount of money that Jeff, you or I could only dream of having. And yet at their age, far junior to what we are. It's almost like they've had three lives compared to our one. And yet, at the same time, 
because it is so polarizing, because it is such extremes, it's very easy to get caught around and to see individuals that are just stuck in their ways. And for all the extreme views that there can be generationally, the narcissistic nature of people is also at an extreme high. And as a result of that, in my belief, it is why that, well, I'm from America, and being an American, therefore, gets me certain natural, God-given treatment. And then I deserve X, Y, and Z because I was born into this specific situation. And as a result of that, and not being able to see outside of your own bubble, because you don't have those experiences, it causes rifts, it causes other countries, other cultures to view us as the pompous Americans. And I think it just gives us an overall bad rap. So, not to get into politics, but from the sheer foreign policy side of things, getting outside our comfort zone, getting outside of our borders, from whether it being our specific state to our international borders, is all a good thing. So, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. For more information on today's topic, you can go to the website, pausethinkconsider.com slash culture. And I look forward to talking to you all again tomorrow on Pause, Think, Consider.